get started in our message this morning, I'm going to ask Denise Loriz to uh, please come stand up here in front of the congregation. Denise uh, has been attending our church for a while now. She's a baptized believer who comes to us, wants to be a part of our congregation. So Denise, I'm going to take your hand and ask you to repeat after me the good confession. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son of the, living God. the Son of the living God. And we welcome you here into our fellowship. Thank you. Denise Loriz. So you guys make her feel welcome today after our service. Uh, we're glad that each of you are here with us today. We are in 1 Peter chapter 4 in our series called Cancel Culture. And, and Peter is writing to the church. Um, it's writing during a time when believers are being persecuted for their Christian faith, when they're being attacked for their faith, when uh, people are... Um, feeling the difficult trials of trying to live for Christ in a culture that you have to say Caesar is Lord. And these Christians couldn't do that. They would say Jesus is Lord. And so they found themselves being outcast by society and uh, being canceled by society. So that's uh, uh, the book that we're studying. We'll be in chapter four. We'll probably make it about halfway through. We'll see what happens. All right. So I was reading an article by Maria Stinwinkel, a corporate consultant from Sweden, who asked 65 people around the world, what is your greatest fear in life? And as you might expect, you know, you heard those typical responses like, well, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job, I'm afraid I might lose my house, uh, fear of dying alone. But of those 65 people, at least 14 indicated a very different kind of fear. One in five expressed some type of fear in terms of living without ever fully realizing their purpose in life, um, living without really finding real meaning in life. Listen to the words of, for example, Anthony from New York City, who said, my biggest fear is never taking a risk in an effort to find my true calling. Uh, Rebecca from Germany said, my greatest fear is to go through life living small but realizing that too late in life. Danielle from Sacramento said, my greatest fear would be missing out on my purpose here on earth. I know I have a purpose that I know I'm not yet serving. Luciana from Portugal says, to go through life without leaving a positive mark. And Ralph from North Brunswick says, my greatest fear is regretting what I didn't do as I lay in my hospital bed as an elderly man. And all of them are getting to this idea that we know that we're supposed to be moving in some kind of direction in life. We're supposed to be moving towards some greater purpose. And in this chapter, Peter is going to refer us, church, back to what that purpose is and make sure that we don't give our lives to what you could say are lesser things. And there's a lot of lesser things out there that could attract our attention away from the greatest thing, knowing Christ and making him known in the world. So let's look at chapter 4, and it begins with the word therefore. And of course, every time you see the word therefore in the Bible, you should ask, what is that word therefore, therefore? He's referring back to chapter 3, where he said, look, you know, Jesus didn't look like he was the winner in the story at one point in that story. When he died on a cross and was buried, it looked like he was the loser. It looked like he was defeated. It looked like Rome won. It looked like the Sanhedrin won, the Sabbath. The Pharisees won. It didn't look like Jesus was the winner. And then he gets to the end of chapter 3 and he says, even though Jesus was, you know, suffering in his flesh and suffering in his body, he was made alive by the Spirit. And now everything is in submission to Christ. All the powers, all the principalities, all the authorities, whether they are earthly or, or supernatural, they all submit to Christ. Authority. What's going on? Am I losing my microphone every once in a while? What am I doing? Am I doing something wrong? There goes Chad. He'll fix it. Click it back and we'll see what happens. Maybe I need a new battery. I know that feeling. I just had another cup of coffee. That's all I know to do. I can only do so much. All right. So where are we at here? Um, we'll just make the best of it. So he says, Christ looked like the loser and yet he was victorious. Now what he's going to do is he's going to say, at times, we as believers might really suffer and look like we're the losers in terms of, you know, how the game of society is going. We might be the ones that are canceled, but just like Christ was victorious, what do you think he's going to say about us? 
that we'll have that same victory as well. So we got to keep our eye on the prize, keep our eye on the long term. Don't get sidetracked with how things seem to be going in the here and now, that there's a cosmic struggle and we're all headed somewhere. Keep your eyes focused on that eternal view. So he says, therefore, Christ suffered in his body. So Jesus suffered. He knows what it's like. We don't have a savior that somehow is disconnected from our suffering. Whatever you're going through in life, just think about Jesus in the garden, being tempted. Think about Jesus you know, under strain and, and stress, wanting to give up, wanting to, if there's any other way besides dying on a cross, if there's any other, but not my will, your will be done. So whatever you're going through, you know that you have a Savior that identifies with suffering. He knows what it's like. And it says, arm yourself with that same attitude, the same attitude that Christ had, that not your will, but mine. And he says, whoever suffers in his body is done with sin. Now, I'm not exactly sure how to take that verse. He may be saying a couple, he may be saying maybe one of these two things, something else, but he may be saying, look, if you're struggling with sin, it's a good indication that, you know, you've, you've tried to put it behind you. You're trying to walk away from it, that you're, you're already going in the right direction. But he may also be saying in this verse that one day you lay this body aside, struggle with sin will be over. And so even if they were to take your life from you, even if you were to be killed for your Christian witness, your testimony, even in that, there is a level of victory in it if you look at it from that perspective. You're leaving the body behind you, the body that struggles with giving in to sin and temptation. And so you will find an ultimate victory. If your goal is eternal life, then what can really death do to you? Because your struggle with sin is over as soon as you lay the body aside. And he says, whoever suffers in his body, maybe dies in his body, his, 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 he's done with sin because it's no longer going to reign over you because you've left it behind. As a result, now watch what he says. Don't live the rest of your earthly lives for evil human desires. You might think of, uh, I didn't put it in the notes, but chapter 1 verse 14 comes to mind where he says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, when you didn't know better, you just did whatever felt good to you, whatever the world was doing, whatever made sense. He says, don't give in to that. Be obedient to Christ. And then he says, be holy as God is holy. There's the standard for us. And here he repeats that same idea that, that we no longer live the rest of our earthly lives for those evil human desires. Now, a lot of times in Christian circles, people up and tell their testimony and what they'll do is they'll say let me tell you how bad I was or how good I thought I was before I met Jesus and then hopefully somewhere in the story they'll tell you how they met the Lord and how he's changed everything in their life and now they're depending on Christ and they're no longer doing the same stupid things they used to do that made sense before they knew Christ and those testimonies can be really powerful when you hear somebody tell you about how they came out of some pretty you know, big strongholds in their life. They're telling you about their past. And it's real important that you deal with your past, but we don't want to live in the past. And part of the Christian message is that Christ can take care of your past, but it doesn't just end with your past. It's about what you do the rest of your life. You might say your, your royal life, R-O-Y-L, rest of your life. God wants to know what you're going to do with the rest of your life. What's your purpose going to be? What's the future going to be? He doesn't just wrap up what you've done, but he wants to direct you in what you're going to do. And so he says, don't live the rest of your earthly life. Now notice, he doesn't just say human desires or fleshly desires, but he puts the word evil on them evil human desires, meaning whatever feels good for the moment. See, the enemy does not want you to think about the rest of your life, doesn't want you to think about death or what's coming at the end of that, just wants you to focus on what feels good right now or what makes you fit in with the crowds right now, what makes you popular right now. And so Paul would say that people like that, their God is literally their stomach because all they're thinking about is how to satisfy and how to gratify those desires within them, which James says, wage war against your soul, these desires. And so Peter says, look, 
You've got to decide what the direction is going to be for the rest of your life. You can't just hope to figure it out as you go. You need to make a decision. It's called repenting when you not only turn away from the past, but then you redirect in a new direction for the rest of your life. Are you going to do this perfectly? No. Thank, thank the Lord there's Jesus, right? Died on the cross for us because we're not going to do it perfectly. We're going to fail at times at this. And sometimes we are going to appear to even look like we're walking backwards, like we're not making progress, but we're losing ground. It's going to happen to you. If it hasn't already, it's going to happen. The important thing is not whether you're gaining ground or losing ground, is that you're facing the right direction. That's what's important. That you don't turn away and face the wrong direction like you used to. You're facing the right direction. Sometimes you seem like you're, ma- you're making progress and you're moving forward. And other times it'll feel like maybe you're losing ground and it's getting difficult and hard and scary and you want to give up. But you got to stay facing the right direction. And so he says, um, the rest of your life... Uh, you should live for the will of God. Say, all right, Lord, what do you want me to do? Not, what do I want to do? That's how most of us wake up, you know? What do I want to do? And some of us, if we were honest, it's really like, well, what does my wife want me to do? Because <laughs> I just want to get along. You know, what do my kids want me to do? What do my parents want me to do? What does grandma expect me to do? What do I got to do? What does the boss want me to do? You know, or what do I want to do today? But we need to ask more than just what do I want to do in this life. You know, there was a time when the church talked about vocation. Vocation, voca, voice, calling. What does God call me to do with my life? What direction is God asking me to go in? So there's a fundamental difference in the orientation of our lives as the church and the orientation of the world. He says, live for the will of God. Now watch this. You've spent enough time in the past. Look at that. That might be some of y'all's life verse today. (laughs) Maybe you needed to come just to hear from God's word to put the past behind you. Some of us dread the past. Like we look back to the past and we're like, oh, I can tell you one tragedy after another. Whatever happened in your life, you ain't heard nothing until you hear about what I came out of. And and in others, we glorify the past. Like, oh, if I could only go back. Or I wish I could go back to rearrange some things. I did some things that I wish I wouldn't have done. I said things. I missed opportunities. And it weighs you down, this failures of the past. And here the Word of God says, you've spent enough time in the past. You spend enough time. You can say spent is awful close to maybe wasted. And the more time we spend in the past, the more time we're wasting right now. And so he says, you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Pagans, of course, are people that subscribe to other faith systems that are not rooted in the Word of God, that are not given to us by our Creator. They're man-made systems of trying to be okay with life, trying to be okay with the divine outside of God's prescribed law and His prescribed will. Now, when we talk about, like, we don't really talk about pagans in our culture, but because kind of the pagans of our day and age are just non-believers, agnostics, atheists. They just, I don't know and I don't care. Or, I don't believe in a God and I don't like Him. Those kind of atheists, you know, Um, or the I don't know, I don't care, apathetic to the things of God or apathetic to religious things. That's kind of our equivalent of pagans in our culture. We've been far different in their culture, but those who do not come to God according to his terms, pagans. And he says, you've spent enough time, church, in the past doing what they choose to do with their lives. Now, look at what the list is debauchery, which most of us are like, what is that? Well, it's kind of anything goes, no rules, do whatever feels good. Debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Sounds like you're all's family reunion, doesn't it? Sounds like... (laughs) 
So, yeah. So, uh, actually, it kind of sounds like a university campus, really. It kind of sounds like the modern fraternity, the sorority, the co ed dorms. It kind of, and there's some schools that like pride themselves on being places like this. I mean, if you don't have any future direction for your life, then you kind of got to say, well, why not do that? I mean, why not just live for right now, whatever feels good, whatever makes sense, whatever everybody else is doing? I mean, if we're not going anywhere, then, you know, this is the only heaven that they'll know. You can't really argue with them. I mean, yeah, I guess it makes sense. Just live for now, live for whatever you want to do with your life. But he says, you've spent enough time doing that. I love what he says there because it's really convicting. He says, doing what pagans, what does it say? Oh, that's not a choice. I can't help it. I was born like this. What do you mean, a sinner? So was I. Aren't you glad there's Jesus? (laughs) We all struggle with something, right? But we are responsible for the choices we make, whether we act on it or whether we don't, whether we behave this way or not. We are going to be judged based on what we do and the choices that we make. And so he says, you guys got to come out of these people. Too much living like the Canaanites. You're supposed to be the people of God, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You can't live like these people any longer. He says, come out of them. Be different. They are surprised when you don't join in with them. When you say, no, I don't do that anymore. Nope, I don't go there anymore. Nope, I don't. Nope. He's like, they're shocked. What's wrong with you? Wait a minute, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to judge me? And then they get into all, not only surprised, but maybe even angry. Like, you think you have the moral high ground? You think that you're Dudley Do-Right? You think you're the, the one to give the rules for everybody? What gives you the right? You're like, no, I don't want to. I'm not trying to fight. <laughs> I'm just trying to live for Christ. And he says, they, they're surprised that you don't join. You know what I'm surprised? I'm surprised when you do join in with them. That's what I'm surprised. Because the church isn't supposed to live like this. It should surprise us when we see people in the church living like the world. That's what should surprise us, but it doesn't surprise us. It's all too common. He says, they're surprised that you don't join in them. They're reckless, reckless. You know, if you, it might be fun to stand on a hood of a car at 45 miles an hour and pretend like you're surfing. That would probably be fun. I think it sounds like a lot of fun, but it's kind of reckless, okay? It's pretty, re- it's very reckless. <laughs> and when you end up in the hospital or the morgue for doing that, you got nobody to blame but yourself because you weren't being careful and that's reckless. Well, living for whatever feels good is reckless, is careless. He says, They're surprised when you don't jump in with the reckless, wild living, and so they abuse you because you won't. It's not because you're doing something against them. It's just you won't nod approval at the stupid that they're doing. You won't say it's fine. You won't vote for it. You won't support it. And so now you find yourself at the end of their despise, and you're not even trying to be there. You're not trying to cause a problem. It says, they heap abuse on you. Look at verse 5. But what they forget is it's appointed for man to die once, and then what? Face judgment. That's what they forget. Look at what he says. They will have to give an account. You know, an account sounds like a bank word, right? Banking. Banking. You know, if you take a credit card or a debit card and you use it, you might forget you used it. You may not even know that somebody in your house is using it. But guess what? The bank, the credit card company, 
they don't miss it. In fact, sometimes they, it seems like they add stuff that you didn't do. And you're like, I don't even know. I've never been to Botswana. I don't know how I, how did I get that on there, you know? And, and so those companies, they keep track of everything you do and every dime you use. And you know, it's real hard to get a bank account to go up, isn't it? It really takes a lot of time and a lot of work to try to get an account to go up, but it's really easy to crash it and empty it out. It's real easy. Like <laughs> our older folks said, amen, right? Yeah, because it could happen really quick. You know, something happened to your wall or your house or your roof or your car breaks down or a kid gets sick or something and boom, or just a, being stupid and reckless. You can empty an account really quickly. And uh, everybody's worried about people stealing their identity. I'm like, go ahead, steal mine, please. I've had it long enough. You take it. Here's my cards. Here's my bank account. You can take it. Have it. You, now you try. You try and figure it out, right? Go ahead, steal mine. I'll take somebody else's identity. You take mine, right? Okay, so he says, they have to give an account, See, they don't want to think about that. We may not want to think about that, that one day it's done and there's a test and you got to stand before the judge of the living and the dead. See, I don't want to think about that while I'm doing whatever feels good, while I'm doing whatever makes sense, while I'm doing whatever I like to do. I don't want to think about there's going to be a test at the end of this semester. You know, if you didn't think there was going to be a test at the end of the semester then why even show up for class? Why write notes? Why pay attention? Why be disciplined? Why care? If there's no test, if everybody gets a trophy, hello? I don't know what kind of church I'm talking to, if I can talk like that, or I think I can. If everybody gets a trophy at the end of this, then why work hard at it? Why, why, why put in the effort? Why show up early for practice? Why give everything when it doesn't matter? Because at the end, everybody gets an A. Now, you see, we might want to pretend like that's the way reality works. But when we open the Bible, we see that ain't the way reality really works. You know, the only class I ever failed in high school was Spanish 1. <sighs> Lo siento. <laughs> it's the only, only class. You know, because Spanish is hard. I don't know if you guys know that, but it's hard. And just because you take it in school doesn't mean you know it. Huh? Amen? Okay. So it was hard, and it builds. It's like if you don't pay attention for a week, you're behind. And the teacher I had, I think she was, I think she was glad I wasn't doing well. She was angry a lot. And Anahato. It was Anahato. And um, angry. And so, you know, but, you know, what's awesome, though, is the Lord knows those who are His, right? That's what the Bible says, so I'm going to claim it. And... So I had to repeat Spanish 1, and I had to go back a grade, you know, and take it with the, with the kids in the, in the grade under me, you know, the little kids under me a year, and I ended up sitting next to this little pretty blonde girl, and uh, the Bible says I'll work all things out together for the good <laughs> of those. So, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to do the Lord's will. And, you know, the Lord works things out. You just got to go with the Lord and just trust him, take him by the hand and let him lead. And uh, so, you know, God works everything out for good. But, you know, I didn't do well in class because I didn't care. I didn't care about Spanish. I didn't care about getting good grades. Uh, I did care about that little blonde girl, though. I cared about her. <laughs> and she helped me quite a bit in Spanish. So, um, oh, that was a long time ago. Wasn't it? Where is she? She's back there. She is holding the baby. There. All right. So uh, that, was, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah, that was you. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, you spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. All right. I should be caring more about my future life is what I need to be caring about. All right, where am I at? Lord, help us. We have an enemy. Where are we at? Okay, so they'll have to give an account. You know, when you don't think you've got a test at the end, then you might as well just play around. But see, what we're supposed to remember is you have to give an account. Now watch this, verse 6. Some, some of the people in the church might be thinking, you know, I just lost my daddy who has a testimony for the Lord. 
You know the word testimony in the uh, Greek language is the word, it's translated martyr. Because everybody in the first century, when they would give their testimony, guess what happened to them? They became martyrs. And so maybe daddy gave his testimony and he was martyred for the faith. And you're in church today thinking, I don't know that I'm on the right team here because people I love are being killed for the testimony of knowing Christ as their Savior. I don't know that I'm on the right team. What happens to dad? He lost. It looks like we're on the losing team. Listen to what he says. This is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. And I think he has in mind those who, not only in the Old Testament, but those who are dying among us for their testimony as believers so that they might be judged according to human standards. In other words, the courts found them guilty. But they're alive according to God in regard to the Spirit. And so there's this sense of like, we can have some hope. The great cloud of witnesses is growing every day. And God does not forget his own. And they may look like they're orphaned in this life, but they're going to the Lord's side. He's keeping them. He's keeping track of them. They're not lost. Look at verse 7. If he hasn't made the point yet, look at the verse. The end of all things is near. Now, does he mean your clock is running out? I think the older we get, the more we realize that, that our time is winding down. And our old folks said, right, our clock, our clock is winding down. Maybe he means more than that. He might mean God's timing is coming to an end. And one day he's going to split the sky and he's going to come back for his church and he's going to take us out of this place. And we will know him as we are known. We will see him face to face. He's going to talk about the earth and everything in it will be laid bare and based on this and it'll all be destroyed on fire. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. And so maybe he's getting to that point here and he's like, don't forget the time is running out. You've spent enough time wasted. You've spent enough time in the old life. You've spent an old, enough time chasing after the things that can never satisfy. The time is coming to an end. Now, that is not a comforting thought when you are enjoying this life. But when you are stressed and struggled and anxious and afraid and all the people that you love are being taken from you, it can be an encouraging thought. And you know what's sad is I don't think it is for most of us. I think most of us, it's like, oh, that's terrible, dread, fear, panic. It might be helpful for us to remember that the posture of the first century church was to look to the sky and say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Lord, come. It could be helpful for us to remember that it's all headed somewhere, that history is moving to a destination. Therefore, since the time is running out, be alert, Sober, opposite of debauchery and drunkenness and carousing and all that list. Sober mind that you may pray. And above all, I love this, above all, if you can't remember anything else, what is at the top of the list of responsibilities for the church? Love each other. Why? Because the world hates you. And they're turned against you. And you're not trying to make it that way. You're just trying to live for Christ. But the farther they get away from the will of God, the angrier they will become toward you. You are going to need each other. You better learn to love each other and get along with one another. And that is going to take something more than like, something more than kind thoughts and expressions. It's going to take something you don't have within you, love. Something that God will have to supply. Because the truth is, is at times you're going to get frustrated with each other. You're irritated with each other, angry with each other. How are you going to stay united when even within the church there's conflict or disappointments or disagreements? He says, above all, most important, love each other, notice the word, deeply. New American Standard, anybody have it? 
fervently. I like that word, fervently. 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 The actual Greek word is, it means strained. Like you're deciding, you know what, I need to lose weight. It's probably a good idea. I've put it off and now I need to exercise. So I'm going to go out and run five miles today. Guess what's going to happen? Anybody been there, done that? You are going to, you're going to pop something. You're going to rupture something. Something's going to get ruptured. You will rupture your nuptials. Okay, something is, something bad is going to happen. You're going to hear it first and then you're going to feel it. All right, something's going to be strained. There's going to be stress and your ligaments are going to be strained. That's the word he uses for what we've got to love each other like. Strained. In other words, it's hard. Do you know what I have to put up with? Do you know how miserable they make me? Do you know what they said to me? And he's like, strain with each other. Fervently. Hold on. Like a tendon in your leg that wants to pop. He's like, strain with each other. Not at each other, but with each other. Under the difficulties, under the hardships, it's going to be sometimes difficult even within the church to get along, but fervently strain along with one another. Don't give up. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. And we could all look at the cross, right? That'd be the first place we might look and see that. Our account is okay with God, not because we worked it off, huh? Not because we worked it off, but because it's all covered in blood. And so when the Lord looks at our account, it's got all the list of everything we've ever done, but the Bible says in Colossians that it's been nailed to the cross. And so it's covered in blood, so when God sees it, He doesn't see the list of all the debits and all the credits and all the scores. It's all just covered by the blood. So the idea is, how about within the church, we learn to do that for each other? You know, Paul says, love keeps no records of wrong. Because you could, couldn't you? You could keep a record. Maybe you've got a record on people. But if you do, just remember that's not love. Love covers a multitude of sin and lets it go and says, because God has forgiven me so much, what else can I do? I got to let him go. Love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality. Why? Because if the world's against you and you lose your job and you lose your home and they burn yours down, where are you going to go? The church will have to take care of one another. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I just wish my kids could come to the table and eat without grumbling. <laughs> huh? Well, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve the others in the church. Faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And then he's going to kind of look at like the elder gifts, the eldership, the bishops, the pastors, the ministers, and the deacons, the ministry leaders, the servants. He says... If anyone speaks, your gift is teaching, words, music, lessons, sermons. If you're going to be a, or rebuking, admonishing, if you have the speaking gifts, then remember that you're entrusted with the very word of God. This isn't my opinion, your opinion. This is God's word, and we need to be careful about how we handle it imperfectly as we, we try. If it's Physical, if it's serving, if it's cleaning, working, sharing, serving, deaconing, then do so with the strength that God provides. Not just serving when it's convenient for you or when you feel like everybody else is doing their part, then I can volunteer too. So that, what's the ultimate goal? That God would be praised in all of this. And then watch Peter, he can't, he can't help himself. He mentioned it, I want God to be praised, I want uh, Jesus Christ to be praised, and then look what he does. And, and, I, and I've got to do that right now. And I've got to just go ahead and, and to him be the glory and the power forever and ever, amen. 
It's like he can't mention Christ. He can't mention the, 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 the goal of living for the glory of God. What does the world have? Oh, we've got all kinds of fun things. You should try them. Why won't you try them? How can you know it's bad if you don't try it? And you're like, look, I can't, I can't be there anymore. I can't go there anymore. I have to live for the glory of God. I have a new direction for my life. I'm not perfect at it. In fact, I'm bad at it. I sure am glad Christ covers sins and washes me and cleanses me. But there's a new direction in my life, and it's got to be for the glory of God.